Over to you, Colin. Um, yep, is uh, my presentation up there, there, Jason? Yes, Colin. Very good. <clears throat> um, I guess we'll start with this first, what I've got up here first in regard to, there's a lot of talk now about regenerative agriculture. Um, and I guess I titled this uh, regenerative agriculture, how and why, because that, I guess that's what we're going to be talking about. But we'll cover a lot of different things. And there's a lot of misconceptions about regenerative agriculture. I guess I, I've been using that terminology for 20 odd years. I don't use that much, as much now as I used to. Um, but unless what we're doing on our farms now, we, we can't do it for at least the next 100 years. We should look at, there's something wrong with that. We need to be able to do something different. That, in other words, what we do should continually improve and regenerate our properties. Um, so we won't dwell on that too much longer. Uh -oh. ah, I didn't think that slide was going to get, move on. <clears throat> Just about myself a little bit. Um, myself and my son Nicholas run the place here. There's 2,000 acres. Um, the property where, well, where I am is Central Tablelands, New South Wales. Uh, in other words, uh, it's about 300 k's north uh, west of Sydney. Uh, granite soils, just, just ordinary granite soils, 600 mil rainfall, and now it's a restored native grassland. A little bit about the enterprises we run here. It always has been a merino sheep enterprise. And I say always, my great grandparents settled here in, the 18, in 1868 and started with merino sheep. So we've We've always had merino sheep, um, and it still is the core enterprise. However, now there's quite a few different enterprises, uh, and starting with that top left-hand corner, cattle trading is one, but I, I haven't done any cattle trading now for, for a few years while these dry seasons have been on, so I probably shouldn't even have it there. But we do some of that at times when we've got, got enough feed. Um, about 500 acres is pasture crop to cereal, cereal rye. And like I said, there's cereal rye and oats uh, uh, and wheat, but now it's mostly oats. We also uh, have a, uh, a, a working Kelby dog stud, which is one of the largest in the world. We sell dogs all over the world. And a merino stud that has been a continuation of stud my father started in the 1940s. The property now is a native grassland, a restored native grassland, which has given us the opportunity to harvest native grass seed and sell native grass seed, which is a, a very important um, enterprise, a, a, a financially very important. Um, but the change of management that, that created that grassland uh, is really what we, we're going to talk about this evening. To answer questions on, on how, why we should change and how we should change, we really need to go back to the beginning. And agriculture actually started in Mesopotamia over 10,000 years ago. And the Sumerian people started to harvest, ha harvest uh, nat native seeds from their grassland. They turned out to be many of the cereal crops that we have today, like wheat and, and barley. and, and and oats came from those areas. And sheep and goats were domesticated around that time, or about 8,000 years ago. Plough was developed 8,000 years ago, and then, then cattle were domesticated uh, and, and trained to pull the plough. Egyptians and later Romans fine tuned techniques, uh, the, the techniques, and then they were adopted or they were moved to Europe the Europeans, and then that's where modern agriculture came from. And it is important to, to understand those beginnings because that form of agriculture that that uh, we adopted failed in Mesopotamia. There's, there's dead that's all right through Mesopotamia, and it's failed everywhere. It's been adopted. So the plough and domestication of animals has created deserts all around the world. 
So we really need to ask the questions, did our ancestors get agriculture wrong? And are there better ways to grow crops? And are there better ways to grow animals? So the important questions to ask, I mean, uh, did we get it right in the first place? And I would suggest we didn't. And we need to ask, ask the question, were the methods of growing crops and managing animals wrong from the start? So for 10,000 years, we've, we have killed grasslands and destroyed soil to grow, grow crops and graze animals. It's actually been a disaster uh, for, the, for the planet and a looming disaster for uh, our species on this planet as well. Now, if we move on <laughs> from those 10,000 years ago, if we look at, at the development of agriculture, after the Second World War, there were concerns about producing enough food for, for increasing world populations. And to address that, a new agricultural revolution was developed to solve these problems. That uh, uh, was labelled the Green Revolution, and it developed new high yielding crops and fertiliser and pesticides to help those crops yield to their maximum. Now, there has been a lot of criticism of, of, of the Green Revolution over the years, um, but actually, when it when it first started, it was actually very successful, and it, and it achieved what it set out to do. It did produce huge amounts of food. This is this was from the 1950s on, um, and, and produced a huge amount of food food around the planet. It did reduce hunger and poverty, and it did create wealth for farmers. And it really does sound like an ideal method of agriculture, and it was. And for that time, my father adopted the, those early that regenerative, sorry, that re, uh, green revolution agriculture, and I grew up on the tail end of that. Um, but you would think, what could possibly go wrong with, with, with a method of agriculture that, that did work well? So, but it has created many problems. It's been an ecological disaster for our farms and planet. It, ha it has created de declining soil health. And this is where the problems start to come in. A dependency on fertilizer, a dependency on pesticides, reduction in food quality and human health problems. And now wealth is with multinational companies. Remember I said a while ago that originally there was, there was the wealth was with the farmers it, it, with, with this, this type of farming. This graph, which is really quite fascinating, it's, it's a, a Canadian graph, and, uh, and I'm searching, trying to get one for Australia, but you can bet it would be the same. And as you can see, it goes from 1926 to 2016, comparing the farmers, uh, the, 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 the profits that farmers are making compared to uh, agribusiness. Like, and what I'm talking about here is the big end of town, not, not the, the local. Uh, supplier down the street selling fertilizer, and that is trying to make a living like everyone else. But if you look at that graph from the 1930s, 40s, and up to the 1970s, or even 1980s or almost, farmers were doing quite well. Agribusiness was always making more money. But then agribusiness just took off in profit while farmers were going broke. There's something dreadfully wrong with that. and. The reason why farmers are going broke is that form of agriculture. Um, the ag agribusiness, and I'm talking about the world agribusiness, has just got simply too greedy. And all we do seem to work for now are, are those multinational companies. That has to be, that has to change, and it can no longer be afforded. So, in other words, many of the things we do in agriculture make someone else wealthy, not farmers. We really did get the wrong end of the pineapple in 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 that for in that adoption of that type of agriculture, or well, that for type of agriculture that's actually been forced upon us. So it has created all many problems, including serious health problems, human health problems. Um, but agriculture is about foods, but there's something fundamentally wrong. If we look at Mineral depletions in vegetables, uh, vegetables, meat, dairy, I've, I've, I've summarised all, all of this. I, I often uh, separate these. 
And most of this information has come from the United Kingdom, from England, from 1940 to, to 1991. And minerals in invertebrate decline enormously from 60 to 90 percent. And you can actually get an vitamin orange today that has no nutrients in it, no vitamin C in it at all. So, and that's directly related to soils and and and, and dysfunctional soil. And poor quality food is caused by poor, poor quality soil. And it's definitely related to serious decline in soil health and soil carbon. Um, some of what I'm going to talk about later, it, it, it will, well, a lot of what I'm going to talk about it does address that. So just quickly on that, I just got, got some slides to remind me on the way through. Is there any questions on that? Because I'm going to move on from, from that now and, and talk about how we can, can fix some of these problems. If there's no questions, I'll, I'll just move on. But remember, you can put questions G'day, in at any Colin. time. And, yep. Yep, we've got one question uh, that came through yep. via the chat medium, and that was, uh, are Indigenous land management what we should be trying to learn from and emulate? Okay, yeah, I can answer that because when I, uh, when I started to change and look at changing, which was in the 1980s, uh, and, and started, I was searching for a different form of agriculture. What I actually was looking at at that time was a, a, a three-way triangle between industrial agriculture, um, agricultural method that, that uh, encompassed ecological, uh, uh, the ecology or natural systems, and uh, and, and then Aboriginal land management. So I was searching for something like that. Um, we need to remember and, and, and be very, very thankful that the Aboriginal people did a wonderful job of, of managing this country before we got here. They, they actually de did develop a very, very, very early form of agriculture and did a very good job with it. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, Bill Gamage's book, uh, called the biggest estate on earth really addresses a lot of what what they were doing. Also, uh, um, Dark Emia by Bruce Pascoe certainly addresses a lot of that too. Uh, so yes, we can encompass some some of some of that. Um, and uh, I will talk about native grasses here shortly. Uh, and and that certainly uh, native grasses and grasslands do uh, encompass. Uh, or some of the management around native grasses can encompass some of that as well. Okay, thanks, Colin. That was um, that's great. We'll we'll hold the other question, um, DB, T, DP, until later on. There's been a few people that have joined us yep. since uh, the start, so I'll just quickly go. The way we're going to be, um, just remind people the way that we're going to have that question and session through here is that if you could go to the to the right hand side of your screen and press the chat area um, you can type in your messages and questions in there and that's just the way because of the numbers of people uh, it's not that easy to moderate um, if everyone wants to talk at the same time so the best way I've thought about monitoring this is um, is to use the type function um, and hopefully that that'll work for people so um, thank you for all, all you people that have, have joined um, since the start and I'll hand it back over to you Colin now okay thank you um, just to move on if we look at what's happened especially from, from the Grand, Re Grand Revolution or since the 1950s, the high rates of fertiliser and pesticides uh, that, that have been used from that point on have done serious uh, ec ec ecological damage to our farms. Um, now, I'm going to talk a fair bit about ecology and 
no one ever ever think that puts a, an agriculture and ecology in the same sentence. But in reality, most of our problems we have in agriculture aren't agricultural problems at all. They're actually ecological problems. And it, once we get our farms functioning as ecosystems, our farms and our soil, soil fun, functioning as, as a soil ecosystem and a farm functioning as, as an ecosystem, those our agricultural problems do go away. There is no doubt about that. Um, and it is the simplest and, and most cost effective way of fixing um, our problems. We, in other words, we can fix all of our problems at once if we have our farms functioning as an ecosystem. So in regard to fertiliser and pesticides, uh, increasing fertiliser and pesticides won't fix our problems if the farm ecosystem is, is broken. So, but how can we fix it? The way crops are grown using ploughs and excessive herbicides and pesticides kill grasslands, destroy the soil ecosystem and destroy the farm ecosystem. Also, the way we graze animals isn't working. Um, they also, uh, or the management of the animals, uh, kill grasslands, destroy soil ecosystem and destroy the farm ecosystem. So it's how animals are managed. There's nothing wrong with having animals at all. In fact, Animals are a vital component, a vital part of, of managing our farms ecologically. So how do we fix these problems? I've deliberately put this slide in here, which seems totally irrelevant. <laughs> uh, it's, but I'm going to talk about how we fix these problems. And I actually put it in here to remind myself. Oh, <laughs> The photo of my great grandparents, who I said earlier that start that, that started here on the farm I'm on now in, in 1868. Now the observant amongst you will notice that my great grandfather has only got one leg. Now there's a bit of a story to this. He fell off a wagon in the 1880s, and he, apparently he wasn't even drunk, but he fell off the wagon. He got run over, and also so had broke his leg. But he had to have your leg, the leg amputated. So that's why he ended up with one leg. So, but what actually happened, there was nine kids in the family and obviously he couldn't do the farm work with only one leg. So old granny, the lady sitting there, my great grandmother, she went out and did all the farm work. And it's amazing, these old pioneering women were, were incredible. And she certainly wasn't, was, not, was not the only one doing, doing that. Not just not that unique, but he went in. It, my, my great grandfather Nicholas went into the, to the house and looked after the the nine kids. She went out and ran ran the farm. Where I'm getting at here with this, she ran the farm differently to him. Being female, she she managed that probably in a different way. In that her whole whole philosophy on farming was different, and. Uh, so, but, but she nurtured the animal, she nurtured the land. But what actually happened, her firstborn grandson, uh, she had a great deal of influence on, on her firstborn grandson. Um, and that her, her firstborn grandson happens to be my father. So, and, and she left a great impression on, on my father, who also managed the, pro the property in, in the same manner as he was taught by his, his grandmother. And I guess that's that's been passed down now uh, to me and hopefully to my son. Um, a, a different way of farming or a different way of, in other words, where I'm getting at here is that agricult agriculture now is, is simply about killing things. We go out there and find out what we can kill today. Uh, agriculture should be about nurturing things, nurturing animals, nurturing the land. Now, why I'm telling this story is that one of the, the best and simplest ways to fix many of our problems that we have in agriculture now worldwide is to have, involve and have more women involved in agriculture, in all aspects of agriculture. They will nurture the land and nurture the animals better than us males do. Males tend to, uh, and um, me being one, <laughs> uh, want to kill things and usually we kill things with bulldozers, plows and pesticides. So that has to change. Um, 
So we'll just move on from that, but, but it is the important thing to say, that one of the easiest ways to fix a lot of this stuff is to, to have more women involved in agriculture. So, in other words, we've isolated ourselves from nature and our farms, our farm soil animals should be nurtured. We should allow the farm and soil to function as an ecosystem. If we have it functioning as an ecosystem, we'll have more diverse pasture, grasslands, crops, better nutrient cycling, which means less fertiliser. No insect attack means no insecticide. No plant disease, no, no fungicide, less animal disease, and then we start to make more profit. In other words, get out of the way and let Mother Nature drive it for us. How? How do we do these things? It's very easy to make comments and, and, uh, and, and say things are wrong, but we need answers on how we can do this. And it's, this is really simple. How we do it is by simply growing more plants, plants, plants and more plants. And it is that simple. But not plants, are, not, not monocultures of plants. We need to cover our soil and farms with a diverse range of living plants. And those living plants preferably should be perennial plants. Um, and I'm going to get onto that more when I talk about grasslands. That doesn't mean to say that if that we need to be planting heaps of perennial plants, we can kickstart our farms uh, in, in other ways. And what we need to get, the, the point we need to get to is a perennial grassland. Now, we don't, it doesn't necessarily need to be a native grassland, but it does need to function like a grassland. It can be, can be all introduced plants, but it needs to have, have a diverse range of, of, of species. I won't go any further into that at the moment. Perennial cover crops, which is, which is pasture cropping, which is another way of doing it, and multi-species annual, annual, uh, annual cover crops. Uh, so is another way of doing it. Um, all of those need, need overlaying with really good grazing management. Just a little bit on, on this part, just a pasture cropping is, is growing a cropping into a, a dormant perennial grassland. Um, and uh, we can also then move that, that, that first slide there is, is uh, uh, a crop of oats growing into grassland, uh, which demonstrates pasture cropping well, but I've, I've been developing multi-species uh, pasture cropping now, and we can grow a mix of many species as well. So, and then to fix degraded properties, one of the better ways of doing it is not put fertilizer on, but or tons of fertilizer, but use multi-species crops for cover crops and or grazing crops. Um, uh, people seem to think they're just cover crops, but they're they can be far more than that. Um, a, a mix of species in, in, a, in, a, in a cover, if we select the right ones, uh, we'll, we'll fix our soil, our soil our, we store our soil ecosystem, soil structure, nutrient cycling, many, many things, and then we can start to move it towards perennials. Um, in other words, those multi-species crops that mimic the function of a grassland and increase soil carbon, nutrient cycling, and restore the soil ecosystem. But, Remember, we've got to move it past that. Multi-species crops are only are only a a way of getting uh, fixing our properties and moving towards perennial species. So, better grazing management, obviously, is is definitely the way way to manage manage our properties. Um, and better grazing management certainly can restore grasslands and pasture. So. How and why did I change? And it it uh, it, do, it will answer some of the uh, the problems. I, I've been through all the problems that every, everyone's sort of been in, and, and uh, most of them were my own fault. But during the 1970s, and this was I, I'd only just come out of school then. Uh, the the cost of farm production was 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 very high on at, at on the property here. And that and it was very high because of the Green Revolution stuff that my father adopted. Um, and it was becoming unprofitable because of, that, of those high inputs. In 1979, we had a major bushfire and destroyed the whole property. Uh, we lost a, a three quarters of our sheep, 
3,000 sheep, all the buildings destroyed, 50 k's of fencing, and we were, we were broke. We went from going okay to, to broke overnight. Um, so that, that fire changed my whole life, as, as they do, um, but I wouldn't change that now for anything because it, it was the catalyst for me to develop all the stuff that I've done. Um, so how did I survive? How do you get how do you get over a fire like that? And many people now are, with these last fire, fires uh, late last year are, are thinking the same things. So, but what I did was uh, there was a thousand ewes survived, and they, they, <laughs> those poor old ewes they uh, they had burnt ears and burnt legs and uh, but but what I did was was um, Use those ewes to, to breed up my, my numbers, uh, sheep numbers here, and double lamb them both autumn and spring. And I kept them till they on the property, they were still rearing lambs at 12 and 13 years old, mainly because I didn't have the heart to sell them uh, after they survived that fire and, and, and basically so, so, uh, saved, saved my bacon. So I just let them die of old age here on the property. Um, so, but and then I grew wheat and, and then learned to have have a sense of humour, which is the most important thing I think. Um, now, because the fire and no money and and, very, and few livestock, I decided to grow more grow, grow crops. I grew those crops the same way as my father had grown them. Um, and but that that method failed with my father uh, eventually, and. So I was ploughing, cultivating, uh, scarifying, cultivating, as he did. And what it did was create poor structured soil, soil erosion, acidic soil, tiny soil carbon, crop disease, and like my father's era, it, it failed also. Um, in 985, I started zero till crops, and and that was with weed control with Roundup, uh, and then herbicide application, three or four more. Herbicide applications in crop, fertilizer, crop years were good at first, but all I'd really done, if you think about that form of, form of growing crops, all I'd done was I'd replaced the plough with the boom spray. I hadn't really changed the philosophy of, of growing crops at all. And things started to grow wrong, declining yields, crop disease, and insect attack. Uh, so every time, everywhere I went and tried to to develop a better cropping system, the wheels kept falling off. So how do I fix those problems? I got some, the, some agronomy advice in 1990, and the advice was to double the fertilizer, um, add urea in crop, use fungicides, use insecticides, better weed control. Now, that was in 1990, the same advice is still given today. And it was bloody wrong in 1990. Uh, definitely wrong now. Um, so I didn't accept that advice. It didn't add up financially, and the recommended amount of nitrogen and fertilizer was toxic to wheat plants. So I thought there's something wrong if uh, the amount of fertilizer I was I was putting on was was was, was toxic to the plants. Uh, there's something got to be wrong here. So how did I solve those problems? Really simple. Went and had a beer and thought about it. So <laughs> that bottle of beer actually come up again. <laughs> Uh, in actually in solving some of these problems. So how did I change? Because we, money was a major problem uh, and really struggling financially. So I looked for low input agricultural methods right through the 1980s. I stopped using pasture fertilizer and pesticides. Um, and there hasn't been any fertilizer put on this property for. Uh, pasture fertilizer, superphosphate, since 1979, uh, 40 years. So focused on 100% ground cover, and then I adopted listic plan grazing uh, in, in uh, well, it wasn't called listic plan grazing, but at the time in 1993, and developed pasture cropping at about the same time. I combined pasture cropping and listic plan grazing in 1995. But what I was actually doing right through all of that time, combination of all those, was focusing on restoring the property to a grassland. And the, there was good reasons for it, at least initially. Um, I knew that, that native grasses didn't need fertilizer. And, and 
there was no one telling me how to do I could develop all this stuff myself. No one was talking about low input agriculture. Well, for me, it had to be almost no input agriculture because we had no money at all. So in regard to, to grasslands, grassland function is the template on which agriculture should be based. So I'm going to talk about grasslands now just quickly. And the reason why we need is that we need to have an understanding of our plants function to be able to understand how we can pasture crop well. Now, just thinking about grasslands and, and uh, 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 types of plants that are native grassland. Now, I'm not necessarily advocating people just have all native grasses. Don't think that at all, but and, and we'll get to the answer to that in a minute. Grasslands consist of winter growing species, which are, are, are called generally C3 plants. So perennial C3 grasses, annual C3 grasses, and summer growing, summer growing grasses, which are uh, C4s, C4 grasses, perennial and annuals, forbs, scattered trees and shrubs. That's primarily what a grassland consists of. Um, except that in Australia here, there, there's 1,080 uh, perennial grass plants in, 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 our, in Australia. Um, 700 orchid species in, our, uh, in Australia, uh, grassland orchid species. Uh, the diversity is absolutely huge. And in any grassland um, in, in, in Victoria or anywhere, almost anywhere around Australia, there's a, around about 300 species in, in a grassland. Um, there, there was here, there was in Victoria. And a combination of those species I have there. So when we're talking about C3 and C4 uh, species, refer to different pathways that plants use to capture carbon dioxide during photosynthesis. And this makes some plants more tolerant of hot, dry conditions, which I'll get to. A C3 plant is perennial or annual, and they grow mostly autumn to autumn, winter, spring. They require more water than summer growing C4 plants, but are tolerant of cold, less than 25 degrees, are not tolerant of heat, over 30 degrees, um, and produce high quality feed. Um, and interestingly, 95% of the of the Earth's plants are C3s, including most trees. Now, uh, these species, if we look at native species, which you have in, in the areas around Victoria, uh, wallaby grass, weaving grass, common wheat grass, plains grass, bee grass, all of those, they fit into the same category as Phalaris, ryegrass, coxfoot and fescue, the introduced part uh, pasture species that we grow, uh, and they're, they're perennials, remember. Um, and our annual crops, annual C3 crops, are wheat, oats, and barley. In other words, those C3 plants grow in the winter, in the winter periods, or those cooler, uh, cooler parts of the month, of the year. A C4 plant can be perennial or annual. Are Australia's dominant grassland species, um, and the, 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 of all the grassland species in Australia, the majority of them are, are summer growing, warm season C4 grasses or plants. Mostly summer growers have very high water use efficiency and are very tolerant of heat. In other words, they'll tolerate heat from 25 to 35 degrees, 40 degrees. Um, and they produce generally produce a, a lot more dry matter, um, but lower quality than C, C3 plants. Now, if on your property you you are uh, it, it, you've got pastures growing through the year, and you're getting to October, and you're dreading the first hot day in October because you know all your grasses are going to be finished and, and, and die, or at least go, go into summer dormancy. And, and so you're dreading the summer. The pro problem is, it, it, it is not the hot weather, but you, the fact that you don't have en enough plants or even any plants that grow through those summer months. In other words, you don't have any C4 plants. You've lost them all. Um, and then almost all the recommendations that we have for pastures are C3 uh, plants. So we're just continuing the problem. So we need we need more more uh, warm season C4 
a place in our pastures. So they are, are uh, the, the native ones are, are things like windmill grass, kangaroo grass, warrego, red grass. The introduced grasses that we can grow are, are digit grass, green panic, rose grass, paspalum. Most of those, except for paspalum, actually come out of African grasslands. Um, and, and you can buy that, those, those, those seeds. And they do grow in, in your environment in Victoria. Just as all of the native grasses up the top there grew in your environment around Victoria. The annual crops that we can grow are that are C4s are things like corn, millet and sorghum. Now this graph illustrates how C3s and C4s function. And if we look at that, uh, the, the pink line are warm season grasses and you'll see that they grow in the summer months and the cool season grasses, which is that blue line, grow in the winter months. And if you think about that as, as a, gra a grassland, in a good grassland, you have feed all the time. In any rainfall event, something will grow, which is the whole point. If our pastures function like that, we'd never run out of any feed. So that's where I'm getting at with when we're talking about grasslands and understanding uh, C3s and C4 grasses or cool season and warm season grasses. Don't forget, we shouldn't forget the, the, the uh, forbs and herbs. Um, there were many uh, forbs and herbs in our grasslands as well. And things like lysines and orchids, ir irises, lilies. Now, the introduced forbs and herbs are cloven, lucerne, chicory, plantain. And if we start re uh, restoring our pastures to function as grasslands, those forbs and herbs can be sown in there. So we get our pastures functioning more like a grassland. This nonsense about having only one or two species in a grassland is, is uh, it is a total heap of nonsense, and that that's part of the reason why we have to keep fertilising them all the time. That uh, the, the farm ecosystem isn't functioning, and, and the soil ecosystem certainly isn't functioning if you've only got one or two species. So, um, what caused the destruction of our grasslands? Um, we talk about um, uh, I, I, I won't dwell on this, I'll run out of time. Uh, mostly what, what happened with our grasslands was that they were overgrazed. And, and if we graze our grasslands too hard, the, the animal, well, sorry, the, originally the animals or the sheep took out all those better species and then we ended up with just poor quality species from those grasslands. Um, the, the, the species, the grasslands were, were exceptionally good grasslands in Australia uh, originally, but due to inappropriate management, we lost the good species. In other words, as I've been saying, I've said a few times, pastures should function like grassland. If a pasture is sown or re -sown, it should have a diverse range of species that consist of summer and winter growing perennial plants. And it should be dominated by perennials. Nothing wrong with having some annuals in there, but it should be dominated by perennial plants. We got any questions on that? At the moment, Colin, we're going well. You're doing a terrific job. We haven't got any questions on uh, the chat feature at the moment. Yep. Um, That's fine. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, here we go. Here we go. Oh, we got oh, some oh. coming into it now. Okay. So, um, I've got a couple here. So. Can we hand seed on rocky ground? Is that appropriate? And how do you keep kangaroos um, on on newly sown? Oh yes, thanks. Off newly sown pastures. Um, maybe that one's not <laughs> yeah. not quite that not quite that, that easy uh, to answer quickly. No. But how about uh, by a sowing on rocky? <laughs> uh, no, the, the roofs can be a problem. Many people now are putting exclusion fences. Roofs become a very serious problem in many areas, and some people are putting exclusion fences around properties, and that's probably the only real long-term uh, permanent answer 
um, and they do work. Uh, some of the good fencing uh, materials now uh, are good for that. Um, uh, what was the first part of that question? Um, oh, can we can we sow parts on rocky ground? Um, generally, generally not. Now, one of the things that when we look at uh, sowing pastures, if we compare that to say native grasses, many of the native species have awns on them. Um, those awns are, 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 have been have evolved uh, over time to to drill those seeds in, in, into soil. Um, in other words, that was basically like a corkscrew on the end of the seed, which which, so which pushes that seed in, into the soil. The seeds that we buy have no mechanism to do that. They have no mechanism to sow themselves. So by spreading seed, it's almost always a, a, a waste of money, except things like clover have been done for years that way. In the 1950s and 60s, people used to aerially spread subclover and it was reasonably successful. And I think because it had a lot of hard seed in it. Um, but most of perennial, perennial plants or perennial plant seed generally is, is not good to, to do that, sow it that way. Or, and, and it needs to be actually placed in the soil with some soil over it to get a reasonable result. So hopefully that answered that, I'll, I'll, and I'll move on to the next um, next slide. Okay, there's another so question. How did here. I in in yep. um, okay in typically weedy country? What is the best way to re-establish this system without hitting the seed bank first? And hopefully, I think that sort of answers Greg your question as well. A way of doing it uh, in weedy areas. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to I'll address that. Oh, I'm going to address that now, which what which is, is some of the pasture cropping stuff. Um, by by stimulating seed that's already in the soil, we can do that. And there is almost always seed in the soil, perennial grass seed in the soil, um, and we can do it. It's one of the best things that pasture cropping does. Is is uh, stimulate seed that that is sitting in the soil, uh, perennial grass seed that can be native or introduced to germinate, and um, I will address that. And hopefully that's the type of question or addresses the the specific question that's being asked. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure we'll, we will address that in a minute. If if I don't ask that again. Okay, so how did I restore the Winona grassland? I'm going to talk a little tiny bit. I'm not going to talk much about grazing management here, but I'm about not specifics, but mainly what I do. Um, and how we're running mostly mostly sheep. When we have cattle, they they go with the sheep, but mostly two mobs of sheep um, on the property here. There's 75 paddocks and there's 2,000 acres. Uh, uh, when we've got uh, full numbers on here, there's two and a half uh, in, in a mob of adults and 1,500 under one year old hoggets. Um, and um, I, I try to have at least three to four months, probably even longer if we can, uh, uh, print it, like plant recovery period. In other words, when we start a rotation, it takes three to four months before they get back to where they started from. Um, adult sheep, in other words, uh, use, are used to prepare paddocks to pasture crop. Uh, it, it's the sheep themselves are a very important part of pasture cropping. So, and that's all I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about in, in, in this talk. Is it, it'll take too long to be talking more about, about grazing management. Uh, as Jason said, uh, we are running a, a, a grazing management management course later in the year uh, if you want to know more about that um, and uh, I, if I started to tell you stuff quickly you, I'd give you enough information to be dangerous to yourself so uh, that's just what we do here so pasture cropping what is it um, pasture cropping was developed this is our bottle of beer again it was developed in 1993 by myself and Daryl Clark Daryl's a neighbor of, of, of mine I, just lived just over the hill, and um, 
we would try to uh, always try to solve big problems. Um, and we often used to get together to have a few beers and we were direct drilling at the time and using uh, high rates of, of, as I said before, in, uh, illustrated before, using high rates of Roundup and pesticides to kill weeds. But we were also trying to kill some of the native grasses that we had on the property. And we reasoned after about 10 beers one night that what, what, what we didn't need to kill those, na those native grasses because they were going into winter dormancy. And if they are in, in, at a dormant stage, they shouldn't affect the crop. So what we started to do at that stage, and that's, that's, that, that stage, not now, but we started to wait until um, the, the, the grasses went dormant and then we'd use herbicide to control weeds. Um, but because those grasses were going into dormancy, it wouldn't kill the grasses, the native grass, the perennial grasses. So that's where, where pasture scrubbing started from. Um, it was two blokes on the grog one night. Um, so pasture scrubbing is more than sowing, sowing a crop into grass. So pasture scrubbing is, is actually perennial cover cropping, where annual crops are zero tilled in a dormant perennial grass or grassland. Um, so why would you grow crops using pasture cropping techniques? And, and why would we change from what we are doing and adopt pasture cropping? To start with, over time, we can definitely generate more profit. Um, and I'll, I'll explain a bit more about that uh, as we go through this. It can and does restore grassland and improve pastures. And it does that by stimulating the germination of seed that's sitting in the soil does produce stock feed, we can produce good stock feed and, and or grain. Um, most of the crops we grow here, we graze as well. It will and does improve soil structure, nutrient cycling and water holding capacity. Um, and over time, uh, it does reduce costs, less fertilizer, uh, herbicide, insects and, and, and fungicide, if that's what you're using now. We can and, and do, uh, uh, reduce all of those inputs over, over time. Um, and I, I always get people to transition off those slowly. If you're using all those inputs, um, transition off them slowly because your soils and your farm are, are addicted to them. And if you go off them cold turkey, you, you'll end up uh, uh, failing really. So traditional cropping methods, um, like plowing or, her or using herbicides. If we look at a, at a paddock that's been prepared for sowing, ask the questions, how much stock food is produced? How much pasture is destroyed? How much soil structure is destroyed? How many nutrients are lost? How much carbon is lost? And how much soil is lost to erosion? Well, all of those. I mean, we don't produce stock food while, while, while we're preparing a paddock now for, for, for a crop. We destroy all of our pasture. We destroy our soil structure, nutrients, the whole lot is lost. I mean, it really is a stupid way of growing crops when you think about it. And that, it doesn't matter whether you're plowing the soil or killing everything with a herbicide. So you have more before you start. Um, and even if we only look at how much stock food is produced, you're destroying all your feed. Um, so, and how often, and it's a term that's been, that I grew up with, uh, how often do we plow ourselves into a drought um, by preparing paddocks to plant a crop? So pasture cropping can produce crops for grain or grazing and improve pasture by stimulating perennial grasses. So all of that, and it does improve the farm ecosystem. Um, now to do this, to achieve this, grazing and cropping are combined and managed where each one benefits the other. And I'm going to just illustrate that a bit more in a minute. So with zero till sowing the crops, never ever ploughing. And focus on the perennial plants that you have. Even if you only, only have one perennial plant in the paddock, make sure you keep it alive. Because if you've got one in there, there will be more and you can bet there'll be seed in the soil. Weeds are managed by creating large quantities of thick litter by using good grazing management of livestock. We know that but if we put litter uh, if, if we build 
good litter cover, good ground cover, we will control weeds because that's what we do in gardens. We've done it for hundreds of years. We put straw on gardens for, for, for a, a few reasons. One is to control weeds. Another is to, to uh, conserve moisture. Another is to uh, control uh, soil surface temperatures. We do that in gardens. Why don't we do it in agriculture? And we can. So, but also, especially when we first start, weeds can be controlled with very careful use of selective herbicides as well. It can be done organically. Um, uh, it, it, it isn't easy, but you certainly can do this organically as well. Now, this our graph again is exactly the same as the, as the, the, the one I showed with native grasses, but this is, um, uh, we, we replace the filters in grasses with a weed crop. They see three grasses with, with a weed crop. Now, this is what I developed here. And, but remember, I start, I didn't start with, with, with any or, or, or very, very few warm season grasses. The management that I used, uh, pasture cropping itself plus grazing management, stimulated the germination of those seeds and now we have a grassland. Um, so that's, that's where pasture cropping fit. It, it sits in there, like where Mother Nature designed it, where cool season C3 plants normally grow. However, if your farm has mainly cool season grasses, which many grasses in Victoria have, um, a, a summer crop can be pasture cropped into it if there's suitable rainfall. Now, most of the ones that are being used as summer crops are in Victoria tend to be forage crops, and uh, I certainly recommend uh, sowing multi-species uh, forage, summer forage crops. So you can do it that way if all you've got is uh, C3 uh, um, or winter grasses and no summer grasses. Also, that will fill a feed gap for you quite very, very cheaply um, if you have no summer feed. I'm just going to take you through a sequence now of, of, of just a, a paddock here that, that it was pasture cropped and, and, and I just took photos of that sequence. Um, so I started with the grassland. That, that's actually in, in, in February. Uh, in the summer, it looks like that now, today. Uh, that is it today. That was a few years ago. So we harvest the grass seed off these, these paddocks. Um, now, after grazing with sheep, uh, in my case, sheep or cattle, it doesn't matter what the animals are, with zero till a crop into the litter and mulch of a dormant, uh, of a dormant C3 perennial grassland. So this particular crop had no herbicide at all because we had that much litter on the ground. There's not many weeds going to grow through that. However, I've been doing this for 25 or more years now. Um, not every Everyone can have that much litter, and people don't have that much litter when you first start. So there's a few things we we, we use, like uh, 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 methods we use, and and usually when we first start, it is with very very selective herbicides, and that is not Roundup. We don't use Roundup at all. We haven't used Roundup on this place for 20 years or more. We don't need Roundup at all. But we we, we can use more selectives, um, focusing on keeping those perennials alive. Um, this just sequence up, up so it was sown into that. Um, and now that's emerging crop up through that litter. Um, the crop is grazed then about that stage or, or a bit before that, uh, before before September, certainly grazed before then. Um, um, just starting to come into head and looks like a normal crop at this stage. Harvest the crop. And that's all the, the, the warm season C4 grass is just starting to come up beneath the crop. Um, so we can have our, 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 our grass as well as, as, as the crop. A couple of questions, and, Colin. Um, uh, those crops, you know, yep, we can have some questions. Uh, one was uh, what type of uh, equipment are you sowing in with into that kind of trash? Yep. You know, discs or time yep. and and depth. And when you talk about selective start, herbicides, yep. what what are you sort of using yep. as selective? Okay. Yep. Now, 
if your main, main uh, problem is broad, a broadleaf weed, just simply use a broadleaf herbicide. There's plenty of them out there. MCPA, um, you know, even Esther, uh, there's no vineyards around you. Uh, those types of herbicides. Now, what I what I looked at early days was uh, desiccant herbicides, which unfortunately was uh, uh, the paraquats like uh, Gramoxone spray seed. Now, no one likes using them. Um, but they they won't kill perennial plants. They'll 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 kill weeds, all weeds, um, and they will, will uh, give the perennial plants a hell of a headache. They'll look like they're dead, but they recover from it. So the desiccants they just burn burn off off the the uh, uh, the top of the plant. I've been looking for a better herbicide than that for years, uh, and, and kept running into in, into um, not problems, but couldn't find anything. Um, now, recent years I've, I've been searching for all sorts of things. So I ran into one that the, the horticulture industry use and the cane people use. And I started trialling it about seven or eight or more years ago. And it's a, a, it's a herbicide called BASTA, B-A-S-T-A, which is glufosinate. And it, it's, as far as we know, it's just certainly a lot better herbicide to use than, than Gramoxone, uh, a lot more user friendly. And it, and it functions in a similar way. In other words, it won't kill perennials at a low at, at, at a, a lower rate. And I've been experimenting now for quite a few years to work out what the rate was. Because no one will tell you. Uh, they just want to kill everything and, and want you to use as much herbicide as possible. But I, but I, I, I use it at, at, at about uh, 1.2 to 1.5 litres a hectare with 100 litres of water per hectare. Um, so that's a better one. Um, it's really unfortunate over the years that, that we haven't had it, been able to find an organic herbicide that really is cost effective. There's some out there, but they're not cost effective in broad agri um, agriculture. Okay. Um, and the other question was, so, uh, um, yep. how are you mm -hmm. sowing into that trash? Oh, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Now, what I what I've got uh, it's a zero till planter and I'm using a, 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 a knife points uh, like a tine with knife points at foot spacings a 30 centimeter spacings um, the machinery doesn't matter too much really I can I converted an, an old international garifier that I had lying around here was not using anymore um, spread the tines out, put knife points on it, and put an air cart behind it. Now, you can spend $100,000 on a seed drill if you like, but you won't grow any better crops with a $100,000 machine than, than converting either an existing combine to direct drill at, at, um, at, at a fraction of the cost. I mean, they'll, they'll grow just as good crops. Um, now, it's in regards to discs or, 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 or points, depending on your soil type, these are great, but um, if your soils are hard and compacted, and most are, often you'll get a, a disappointing result with, with a zero-till disc planter. They have to be zero-till, direct drill or zero-till, not not a normal normal combine uh, at all. The, the, the tines aren't strong enough or the springs aren't strong enough on, on machinery that's been designed to sow into plant soil. So it has to be... Uh, a, a, a direct drill or, or zero till machine. Okay, I'll just move on. Um, we, we oh, sorry, I'm just sort of working for the sequence here. The, after grassland is, uh, uh, sorry, after crops harvest, we graze that grassland. The quality of, as you can see in that slide there, the quality of the grass is, is extremely good. and. This slide, we, we normally graze uh, the, the paddocks with, with, wean, with our weaners because it's the best quality feed on the place, uh, the, the grass that was growing on that, on that crop. Um, we then harvest native grass seed after the cereal crop was harvested again. And a lot of the seed now, and, and I won't go into it because we're, we're going to run, run short on time, um, is now, he, 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 it's, it's sold now for, for rear vegetation, but in the future, it's going to be sold for human consumption. Uh, and I'm involved with Sydney Uni uh, um, and the, the Aboriginal Kamilaroi people up at Narrabri Research Centre. 
looking at some of these grass seeds for to be made, made into bread or flatbread. And there's some very promising results coming through. In, in other words, rediscovering uh, or relearning a lot of that lost Aboriginal knowledge. So I'm just going to move on to multi-species uh, pasture cropping. Um, now, now I'm just going to go very quickly through these slides here because they're exactly the same slides. And I'm, why I've got them is that we use exactly the same process to grow a multi-species crop as we do a, a, a normal single species pasture crop. So we're still harvesting seed and we're sowing into, we're gra grazing it, creating mulch. Um, but then we're sowing a mix of species into them. In this case, uh, what I've been sowing is oats, forest brassica, vetch, radish, daikon radish, um, clover at times, field pea and turnip. And I've started to use some faber beans now. Um, um, the um, uh, field peas, all sorts of stuff as well. So, um, and we're finding the species you can get in there that the better soil health benefits you get. And also excellent grazing. So that's the, that mix uh, there. And uh, so, which is, I, I suppose looks, most croppers look at that and think what a dreadful crop that is. Um, but that particular crop, I don't think I've got, I haven't got it in this presentation. It's gonna take too long. Um, we harvested that as a mix of species, which was interesting. Um, and uh, and then re use that seed for re-sowing in crops in the future. Uh, use that mix. So that's just a photo of, of a multi-species crop growing amongst um, dormant uh, summer grass. Uh, very, very high quality feed. And you, you think of cattle or sheep grazing that, they take a bite of that green feed, then they take a bite of that dry feed and mix it. And they do really well on it, that mix of, of, of uh, dry feed. We need to remember that cattle and sheep are ruminants. They need a lot of roughage. Um, just uh, more photos. That's a daikon radish, which is a little radish in there. Um, now, a mix of food and species sown into a grassland does produce better quality uh, feed. Uh, faster improvements in soil health, it really kickstarts the soil very, very rapidly and make nutrients available. We can add, add uh, legumes and there for nitrogen. Um, it, you can get really good weed control, especially if you increase the brassicas in there. Um, and we can manipulate uh, or, or change the ratio of these species to achieve different outcomes. We can get insect control by adding more flowering plants. And we can uh, harvest a cereal crop also after grazing. Um, so, what did I do on, on Winona? Um, and I'm just going to get, just present a little bit of, bit of uh, data on this, uh, not, not a lot. I changed the grazing management to illicit grazing in 93 and changed the rate to pasture way of the root crops uh, in 93. And I didn't sow any native perennial grasses. It's an important thing to remember. The process, the pasture cropping process, stimulated those, those seeds to germinate that were in the soil. Um, now, what we have now is restored perennial grassland. And I start, I didn't start with the grassland, the, the property was, was just weeds. And down the, uh, uh, it, there was 60% uh, weeds on the, play, uh, on, on the place. Now there's less than 5% and annual weeds. Um, and the native grass species are uh, increased from 10% uh, to over 80% since, uh, uh, since 1999. And the, the, the species that we monitored here increased from nine to 60 native grassland species. Um, and that's without sowing any seeds. Uh, so we haven't used insecticide for over 25 years and we don't have insect attacking crops or pastures. How's that? Um, this, this was some work done by at least Wyndon uh, at Canberra Uni and measured uh, insects at home so that we have, and she found we had 600% more insects on this property and 125% more diversity. And we no longer have insect attack in pastures or, or crops. And it's because a big percentage of the insects are actually spiders. Or, uh, the, and so what I'm getting out here is that insecticides are 
uh, we, we need more insects in, 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 our, in our pastures, not less insects. We, we need insect diversity. Insecticides are not selective and will kill predators as well. One of the worst things we do is use insecticides. And insecticides will lead to more, it lead to more insects and more and, and, and more insecticides. So we need more more insects, not less. We haven't used fungicide for over 25 years, and we don't get crop disease or, or, or pasture disease. Um, and that's because we, it, our microbial tests, it's very similar to the insect world. We have more diversity now of all, all our soil uh, mic microbes, fungi, bacteria, protozoa, nematodes. And so uh, having, having healthy soil with large diversity of soil microbes, in other words, a functioning soil ecosystem will control plant disease. We haven't used fertiliser on pastures for over 40 years. Um, and crop fertiliser has been reduced by 70%. And I've, I've moved more and more towards uh, biologicals and, and organ organic type uh, uh, fertilisers. Um, so how, is that, how does that happen? By growing plants that are diverse, uh, living growing plants that are diverse, and they are the drivers of soil health, soil structure and nutrient cycling. And plants add dead and decaying material to the soil. Um, which is roots and surface litter, which feed, feed microbes. And plants are due sugars in, in, into the soil, which I think is the most important thing, uh, which feed soil microbes. Um, now, so there are more, far more ways of supplying nutrients to plants than applying fertiliser. Things like mycorrhizal fungi supply phosphorus, nitrogen, trace elements, and also water. Um, Protozoa are nematodes, eat bacteria and fungi, which supply nitrogen and other nutrients. And freely we nitrogen fishing bacteria supply nitrogen. Um, so if we get this right, um, we can get nutrient cycling and, and actually make nutrients available uh, and, and, and get the whole thing functioning. And it isn't that difficult. And, and again, like I said earlier, it's about getting your farms and soils functioning as ecosystems. This is just some, uh, some data. The, the, the property here is one of the most researched properties uh, in Australia. Um, and uh, I haven't presented a lot of that here because of the time constraints. But the soil carbon now is a, a, it, it's, it's increased by 30%. So it increased, it, it's actually sequestered um, over three, 200 tonne of carbon dioxide. In other words, it's removed. 200 tonne of carbon dioxide per hectare out of, out of the atmosphere and put in the soil as carbon. Um, plants have done that. And, and plants are the answer to all of this stuff. It now holds over 200% more water, the soils do. And all the soil nutrients, including trace elements, have increased by an average of 172%. Um, and, and for example, calcium has increased by over eight eight tonne per hectare, or 277%, there's been no line put on. Um, and uh, that's about getting our soils right. And pH has changed from 5.2 to over 6. And this, these are granite soils, they're not, not heavy soils at all. Is it profitable? Um, in that, remember, I, no, I, I, I said in this talk, the, the system that we had in place, like that high input system, uh, fertilising the whole property, uh, and so a, a lot, lot of pesticides, all that stuff, was costing us $80,000 a year on today's figures. Now, uh, when, since I've changed, I no longer use those products. I no longer use all that fertiliser, don't use pesticides, and I save $80,000 annually. I don't spend that. So I'm eighty thousand dollars ahead before I even start. Um, so yes, it, it, it's extremely profitable because of, of less costs, but our production is actually uh, is, is actually about the same as it was before. We haven't. I'm not claiming it's more productive, but it's about it's just as productive. So that that savings were is about fifty thousand dollars on pasture fertilizer, twenty thousand on cropping fertilizer. We don't re-establish pastures. 
um, and ha have perennial pastures with over 60 species in them, don't have insect attack. We're now re regenerative and resilient, and it functions in an ecologically sound way. We are profitable now. So, now compared to the previous method of agriculture, annual income is higher. We're now running more livestock. Our crop yields are similar, wool quality is better, and we don't drought feed livestock. We now harvest well over a tonne of native grass seed. It's an important enterprise mix. We'll probably harvest two tonne this year, I think. Um, so carbon levels are increasing and all those nutrients are increasing with $80,000 less inputs and less labour. I, I haven't counted labour in that $80,000 uh, of savings. So in other words, agriculture and sound ecological practices should function together. Um, and our farms should function as ecosystems. It's a couple of very important things. So how do we restore our farms? Change the way we graze animals, grow crops without killing existing grasslands. In other words, stop ploughing and reduce pesticides or pasture crop it. Grow multi-species crops, especially to kickstart uh, uh, dysfunctional or poor structured soil, or preferably do all of the above. The more things, there's a lot of good techniques uh, and, uh, the, the, the around the world that, that uh, are being implemented, not just simply the stuff I use, but a lot of other other good stuff, like the permaculture principles are, are good. Um, uh, Peter Andrews' as, uh, um, work he's done on rivers and creeks is good. So there's a lot of good ways of, of doing this. We don't necessarily need to get stuck in one thing. Um, so as many of these things we can put together, the better. So in other words, plants will restore our farm soil and profit. Um, so agriculture can be more profitable and regenerate our farms, ecosystems and the planet, but agricultural practices need to function closer to how nature had it originally designed. And, and that's the end of this presentation. I've got another couple of little slides to show you though. On um, April the 2nd, there's another webinar which is in more detail. This goes for uh, two and a half hours or so. Uh, Latani McDonald's actually putting that on, um, and she lives around, uh, not that far, I don't think, from um, Kyneton, somewhere around there. Um, and um, that there's some details there on, on, on that. And also, um, I've been working with some fellow, young fellows from West Australia called Smart Soil, um, and they've actually, well, the combination with me, I put together an online pass growing course, very detailed. It we're, took a week to film that, so there's a lot of detail in that. And we can learn about all sorts of things, like what we spoke about tonight, but much more than that. And there's some contact details. You can contact me or, or the Smart Soil uh, fellows as well on that. So, um, have we got more questions? Yes, we've got a couple of questions, Colin, and um, in no particular order. But one is you talk about um, sheep and cattle doing the hard work. Um, can horses do the same hard work? Yep. Yes, um, horses can. At any animal it doesn't matter what the animal animals are. They they can be sheep, cattle, horses, elephants, if you like. It doesn't matter, the, the animal doesn't matter. It's how we manage them that, that is the point. One of the problems with horses, everyone blames, blames horses, but we seem to forget that one horse is probably equal to 15 sheep to start with, um, and they can graze really closely, um, and they are a bit selective, so you tend to get more weeds where you've got horses grazing. I've done some work with some people that, that run horses and, and, and simply put them together in, in, in a mob. They generally get on, they, they, they're herd animals anyway. They put them together and, and start rotating them just like we do cattle. Um, and, and it works, the same thing. It doesn't matter what the animal is. Okay, I've got some people sending in um, questions throughout. Uh, to remind me to bring them up, so thank you for that. Um, so 
you spoke about certain seeds in that rocky country not worthwhile because of the coating. Um, is there any seed suppliers that you would recommend or mixes that you would recommend to spread on um, both uh, normal so you know normal um, soils, but also that rockier soils where you might be spreading it by hand? Yeah, um, it is difficult without. I'll, I'll give you a better way of doing it. Uh, well, I'm not avoiding the question, but but it is thought with for, with with danger. Like it, it's very difficult to get get plants to establish that these plants that that ha don't have a a seed sowing mechanism in them. If you're going to just spread them, now a way that it can be done uh, is. Is cattle are the best to do this. Uh, in a, uh, any sort of supplement, if you put uh, pasture seed uh, in a supplement, or well, even in, in mix it through grain or anything, whatever you're giving them, a mix of pastures, pasture species, they'll eat that grain. And, and with cattle being cattle, it's cheaper, it don't work as well. Uh, it, a lot of that seed will grow, go straight through them. So it ends up in, in cow manure in a perfect environment to germinate in heaps of nutrients and will germinate out of the cow manure. So that's a better way. Rather than spread it, if you've got animals, especially cattle, uh, put it in put it in, in, in some form that 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 uh, and mix it through some for some uh, either supplement or 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 feed and, and, and spread it that way. Then you'll get a better result. Uh, if you don't have machinery to sow it or your area is too rocky. Okay, um, just going back up to uh, other questions. Hopefully that's um, answered some ways of getting um, small holdings would be the same way, Colin, I suppose, is, is feed some seed yeah. through through the animals. Um, yes, that, that's right. We know that that happens with cattle. You feed cattle grain like oats, there'll be a lot of oats or wheat, whatever, come up in the cow manure. Um, so we can do it. And I, what I, I didn't address properly uh, the species, but I mean, whatever pasture species grow in your area, to start with, it, you, you would put in that mix and, and, and a diverse range. You don't need, uh, uh, you don't need a lot of seed, but, but diversity is the key. Um, and, and ideally a big percentage of perennials in there. And, and you will start to get establishment in some of those hard, to, rocky, uh, poor soils. Do herbs and other work that way as well? Do you know of Colin? So the mixed species would work through the animal uh, on smaller holdings? Yeah, um, things like chicory and plantain, which are, are herbs, would be good to include in there. Some loose would be fine. Uh, clovers, definitely, clover will definitely work. Um, um, but, but some of the perennial grass species, and, uh, and you might find, uh, unfortunately, there hasn't been much work done on this other, other than pe people, are, it's, it's been done quite a lot, but I mean, mostly farmers just, just do it. I, I don't know of any research work that's been done, which is a real shame because we know it works. It'd be nice to see, to see some, some uh, just from research work, just what percentage, not only what percentage grows, but there's be some species that, that it, it won't work with, and we, we don't know that. I'm still uh, working my way through some of these questions. You just have to be patient with me. Um, one here, what is the smallest paddock size you can use for good rotation? Um, the, the smallest, oh, the smallest paddock size. The pa oh, it, it can be extremely small, if you like. That depends on the mob size, really. Um, now, it starts to go into a fair bit example, of the grazing stuff that we, we would talk yeah. about in the course, isn't it? It's, there's, that, that's right. Yep. And we're starting yeah, to I'm get to giving that... information that could be dangerous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm making an assumption that, that it's probably a small holding. Um, so if you've got 50 sheep, for example, 
you can put them into an area that's half a half or well, quarter of a hectare if you like. You can put them into a smaller area as, as you like, but you would then adjust the time that they're in there for. Uh, so it, it's it's one of those things that you need a bit more information to be able to answer it well. Uh, if you had a thousand sheep, well, you're not going to put them into a quarter of a hectare. Uh, but um, many people now, there's different forms of, of, of uh, that form of grazing, of, of holistic management or that form of grazing, and they can be relatively small, small areas uh, and generally done with, with electric fencing or can be large areas. Here, I just use, use paddocks about 20 acres and I put two or 3,000 sheep in them. Um, and and that, that works for me, but some people do it more intensively than that. Um, do you recommend working ground up the first time after it's been compacted uh, for a long time or never been tilled or what's your recommendations there? What the question was, do, do I recommend ploughing it if it hasn't been, hadn't been tilled? Is that what the yes. question was? Yeah. yeah. If it's no, very we compacted, should, we shouldn't be plow. Yeah, we shouldn't be plow and, and be, and be careful. Shouldn't be displowing it at all. Um, now, uh, displows are so destructive. I mean, and especially if it's a paddock that that it hasn't been ploughed for a, a long time or at all, definitely don't plough because there's a lot of potential in paddocks like that. There will be. Uh, really good quality native species in there that just simply aren't expressing themselves at the moment, either through overgrazing or compacted soil. Um, change, change the grazing management is one of the first things I'll do on it. I, I, I would do, uh, you know, get them uh, into tighter mobs and rotate them around. Um, now, you can you can uh, uh, use like, like something like a yeoman's plough to break that up. But be very careful with that um, and, and don't overdo it. Uh, Yeoman's plough really only needs using once and then sell it again or borrow it in the first place. Um, because if, you, if you're coming back needing to use it again, it means that, that you haven't managed it well after that point. Um, but definitely don't, don't plough it. Now, we can use things like, uh, and by, by using some of the techniques I spoke about t t today, tonight, um, things like uh, turnips and tillage radish and, and, and those, those diverse, a diverse range of, 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 um, of species that will, will penetrate down through those hard compacted layers, break up that soil and, and they're basically biological subsoil of some of these things like the daikon radish or tillage radish and turnips. I'd use them. Um, I'd, I'd drill those crops in first time. You might get a very ordinary result. Don't don't get, worry too much about that. Go in again and do it again. Um, and what I always recommend is to, if you're trying to fix a paddock like that, uh, plant a winter multi-species mix, and then go in and, and plant a summer a summer one straight after. And then so do that, and then back to a winter one, then back to a summer one. By the time you get to the fourth crop for a lot, um, you're just about to fix that paddock. Uh, that if we get the right mixes of species in there. Um, I do uh, workshops also on, on multi-species crops and, and cover cropping as well um, uh, to, to really illustrate that I did, um, you know, I've done quite a few of those around the country. But anyway, but we can tailor those species to do that. and, and I would definitely do that instead of ploughing. Don't don't plough it. Do um do these methods work in a range of different soil types um, and areas? Uh, yes, yes, they they work anywhere, anywhere you can grow plants. It doesn't doesn't matter. Like um. There's a big adoption now of what I've been talking about tonight, pasture cropping and all that in America. I was actually due, due to go to America at the end of this month, which obviously not happening now because of the coronavirus. But I was doing, going to do some workshops in Texas and, and uh, well, Texas, Colorado, and speaking at a conference. <clears throat> so there's a lot of adoption in the US. There, there's adoption in South Africa, 
South America. Uh, some adoption in Europe. Europe's a bit different. Um, so it, 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 that will work anywhere. But you do need to fine tune it for your area and soil type. Um, and grow species that suit your area, uh, whatever it is, whether it's that's a, a multi-species forage crop or or if you're resowing pastures, it has to suit your your particular area, rainfall, soil type, all of that. Um, just uh, is there anyone else out there that um, has got a specific question that I haven't already answered? Oh, Colin, I don't, I'm not answering them. Colin hasn't answered. Um, we'll just wait a, wait a minute or two, and and um, and then we we might might finish finish up there if there's no. Um, questions in the next minute or two. I might, might while uh, if there's anything else coming through, I'll, I'll just say again one of the most important things with any of this uh, adoption of, of any new or different form of agriculture or change is to, to do it carefully and transition into it slowly. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of what not to do. I, many years ago, I, I was in, up in, in Queensland and and um, the first place I was on was, uh, was, was buffalo grass and I had no experience of, some, of pasture growing into buffalo grass. And I told him, just do a small area and, uh, and see how it goes. Well, Anyway, this fellow started sending me photos of his crop and he was very excited about it all and how it was going. And I asked him, how many acres did you sow? And he said, a thousand acres. And I thought, buddy, oh, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> uh, just just trial a small area and see how, how it goes and, and trial things slowly. Um, and also transition. One thing that does, does concern me uh, when people adopt this and you have a paddock full of weeds and you want to do it organically and there's, there's certainly uh, you know there's merit in doing things organically but the basic agronomic principles still apply if you've got a paddock full of weeds a paddock full of anything and you try and sow something in, into it with, without doing anything about those weeds it's, you're going to fail I, you've got to be care, be careful now like about that um, now uh, while, uh, if anyone's out there with organic, and there would, would be some organic producers, what I've found that does work well, showing organically, the yeoman's ploughs, and I hope I'm not giving enough information to be dangerous to yourself here. The yeoman's ploughs are, uh, I've found that they're uh, two feet between each time, and that when you, you don't, not rooting deep with them, but just, just going down just far enough under the plants, will kill plants about eight inches wide. Now, quite a few people now are starting to put uh, seed boxes and even seeding discs behind their yeoman's ploughs and sowing all sorts of things into that little kill zone, eight inches wide, and getting some really good results doing it totally organically and, and, and getting getting good results uh, by sowing um, either pastures or multi-species crops, all sorts of things. Um, so that's one way you can do it, but but you're still doing something about those weeds, and that happens to be a mechanical little uh, killed area. But it, it is how, now, a question: how yeah, um, how to seed a small five-acre area with no cattle, only goats, and not feeding any mm. supplements, and with no machinery? Is is it still trying the same yep. method? Feed some seed yep. to some goats we, and we, see what happens. Yeah, yes, you, you could. Um, they're, they're probably a bit more efficient eaters, uh, and, and not a lot will go through them. But if if you've got five acres and goats, <coughs> get create as many paddocks as, as practical to you, or many areas, little little areas, and, and and start to rotate them around. Put them all together as many as practical, 
and, and, then, and then start to rotate them. So in other words, you're using those animals to mulch and manure your paddock uh, and, 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 and then move them on, trying to recreate a rest period for as long as possible on the paddock that you first started from. Um, and it, it works on any area, any acreage, and on on uh, with any animals. And goats would be fine. And have you found uh, that this helps with preventing or lowering the use of drench for your stock? Most definitely, yes. Uh, that form of grazing, especially if you can get the recovery period, the red, the plant plant recovery period out long enough, four, five, six months more or more, uh, then yeah, yes, many people that get, get their grazing really good with good long recoveries, um, it, it, find they don't need to drench. So you absolutely can, can do that. Another question was, um, have you seen earthworms taking over some of the subsoil tillage and whether he's looked into introducing deep burrowing blackhead earthworms into his soil? Yeah, interesting one. Um, just uh, on some stuff that uh, happened here. Um, I'm talking about 30 years ago. Uh, there was no earthworms on this country at all. And even I'd saw scientists here uh, and looking for earthworms and couldn't find any. The con and this is granite soil, fairly gravelly granite soil. And the conclusion, even with this soil scientist, a nice, good soil scientist and real nice luck, um, said that he thought that, that earthworms didn't live in granite soil. Well, as it turned out, the same type of things happened. Uh, when I changed, the, 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 uh, changed what I was doing and everything started to fall into place, the soils improved, there's heaps of earthworms here now. It, uh, you shovel full of soil, you get heaps of earthworms in it. So there must have, must have always been some here, but they didn't, there wasn't many, or they didn't want to live here because the conditions weren't very good, very suitable for them. Uh, as for, oh sorry, as for introducing uh, earthworms, I have never heard of that being done. Um, I, yeah, I'd be wary about it. I, I'd try to stimulate the ones that are already in your soil. Um, it's a bit like anything, um, uh, generally introducing something that, that doesn't want to be there or hasn't been there, it generally doesn't work. And uh, a saying that I use, not related to earthworms, uh, but in regard to agriculture, uh, or the way we farm them now, and around the world, is that that, that we, we uh, grow things that want to, want to die and kill things that want to live. Uh, and that's what we do in agriculture generally, like some of the pasture species we sow don't really want to be there, and so we prop them up with a heap of fertilizer just to keep them alive. So in other words, grow whatever you grow on your property, grow things that want to be there and want to live there. Don't, don't change the soil to suit the plant. Select a plant that wants to grow in your soil type. Okay, uh, another one is how can small family operations be supported to keep up with this changing use of methods discussed, whilst fending off large corporations, etc., what would you say are the most important adoptions for these types of operations to launch from? Just repeat that again and make sure I understand what the question actually was, especially the first part yeah. of that. What I might do is um, I might unmute the person who asked it to then give us a clear question. DP, are you there and able to talk and ask the question? We can hear you, DP. Oh, gosh. okay. Sorry. We'll, we'll, <laughs> I'll try again. Got a sleeping baby at the moment. Can't ask the question. Um, I'll ask it again for her. 
<laughs> them. How can that? This, that's one of the great benefits of doing it this way. It's not uh, possible to have done it at the community hall. Uh, how can small family operations be supported to keep up with this changing change using the methods discussed, whilst fending off large corporates, etc.? What would you say are the most important adoptions? for these types of operations to launch from? Yep. Okay. That's a great question, actually. Um, now, one of the advantages of, of, of this form of agriculture is that it doesn't cost much. I mean, we can do this with, with almost nothing. And remember, I had to, when, I, when I was developing a lot of this stuff, I had to do it without any money. Um, and I think the the, the best way to do it without with spending very little money is, is and, and, and very important is to change the grazing to start with, to the type of stuff I was talking about. Um, and, and that can be really low cost. Um, it can be low cost, uh, especially with cattle um, or even goats uh, um, and some sheep, uh, the shedding breeds, it's that. It is to put in electric fence. Electric fencing or, or just tape can be can be really cost effective. Um, so it doesn't have to cost a lot, um, and, and that's the whole point with this. I mean, the problem with the way agriculture has been practiced is is that it just simply costs too much. So we need to get away from that about big costs um, and and giving money to multinational companies. We need to keep it ourselves. So. Yes, we can. We can do that, and grazing is the first thing I think to implement. Um, and, and things like uh, um, improving the, the, the sort of adding seed to the pasture through the animals is another way you can do it. Uh, another way that I like, we were talking a while ago, and I just realised and thought about it. Uh, some people have have had some success of spreading seed. Before the animals go into a pad, just throw the seed around, around an area, then graze it and trample that seed into the soil. Um, and some people have had, had some success at doing that. And, and often when you do that, you trample it a bit harder and graze it a bit harder than you, than you would normally. So it's just another way of doing it without costing anything. And I, I'm with you there. We should be doing this stuff as cheaply as possible, which is, which is why I say don't don't go spending hundred thousand dollars on a seed drill if you want to make you want a seed drill. You can often often uh, uh, convert some old machine that's laying around behind your shed. Um, and um, I didn't put any of that. The talk I've got to do on Thursday, I'm going to talk a lot more about machinery and machinery conversions in that. But I had to sort of keep this a bit shorter this talk. All right, um, I want to thank you Colin um, and I'll do that in, in I am now going to un, un, unmute everyone so everyone that's um, um, now going to become unmuted so that they can give you a round of applause if they don't have a sleeping baby nearby um, so you can now hear the people that you have been talking to so really well um, and not getting the feedback from the audience that you're normally used to. So I'm just going to unmute everyone now. And all of you start to your hands together. So there, are, there are some people out Thank there, you. Colin, um, and they can now unmute themselves. I'm still muted. All together. And, uh, and at least you can hear that you were talking.